On behalf of Grace Initiative Global, I would like to welcome you to our session held on March 23rd, 2021, during the 65th UN Commission on the Status of Women Conference. Our session is titled Addressing and Preventing Gender-Based Violence Through Empowerment and Generation Equality. We are pleased to include a worldwide perspective embracing dedicated and compassionate experts representing organizations in Vermont, Geneva, Brazil, Iraq, Colombia, and Uganda. Our experts will discuss the sobering situation of gender-based violence for women and girls globally, which only intensified during the COVID pandemic. With the onset of the COVID pandemic, gender-based violence increased exponentially. The cataclysmic crisis of COVID included health risk and sadly loss of life, food insecurity, job loss or reduced hours and prolonged shutdowns. Regrettably, COVID also fueled stress and anxiety, which led to an increase of household tensions, exasperating domestic violence. Loss of economic opportunity also caused many women to increasingly take jobs or look for work in the informal sector where they were more exposed to risk of sexual harassment and abuse. Women and girls already in a perilous situation as displaced or as refugees also faced further insecurities and physical harms. For example, in the United States, research found that an increase of domestic violence also resulted in an increase in the severities of injuries reported. UNHCR found that young women as refugees or as displaced suffered an increase of sexual violence and consequently causing a rise in early pregnancies. No wonder the increase of gender-based violence because of COVID has been referred to as the shadow pandemic. To address and prevent gender-based violence, Grace Initiative proposes a strategy for women and girls through a transformational process. This process we call SHE, which is comprised of three mechanisms. The first being finding a place of safety or offering a, a place of safety. Second, about, it is about focusing on healing and healing not just of physical injuries, but also of trauma and trauma care and finding a sense of self-agency and dignity. And the third focuses on empowerment and empowerment we mean by capacity building, vocation development of vocational skills and income generation. This is a path that we think that could also lead to resilience. Our speaker from Iraq will speak about our projects in Iraq that relate to this program called SHE, especially focusing on income generation and entrepreneurship. As pointed out, our session will provide an international panel on addressing and preventing gender-based violence. Our first speaker is Karen Tronsgaard Scott. She is the executive director for Vermont's Domestic and Sexual Violence Network. Vermont's strategy of addressing and preventing domestic violence focuses not only on a single cause, but rather a holistic one and with a, with a mission of uplifting everyone. In this regard, the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence is working to uproot the causes of violence to build a world free of oppression where actions, beliefs, and systems of support all support everyone to thrive. Karen brings a wealth of experience to this mission, having worked in Sri Lanka, as well as other organizations focusing on gender violence, as well as restorative justice. Following Karen's remarks, we will hear from Ms. Zaytun Faraj from the permanent mission of Iraq to the UN in Geneva. Her remarks will focus on the situation in Iraq. From Brazil, we will hear from Ms. Monica Villarindo, 
an advisor for Grace Initiative based in Rio de Janeiro. She will discuss the situation and the conditions for women in terms of gender-based violence, but also give some examples of hope. Following Monica, we will hear from Ms. Roseanne Santiago. Roseanne is the Director for Business and New Partnerships for CIES, which is one of the largest NGOs in Brazil. CS focuses on youth, including young women. CS proposes a strategy for change based on also transformation leading to dignity and also permanent hope. From Iraq, we have two speakers. First is Mustafa Saad Abbas, who is the heading the Grace Initiative office in Iraq. He will discuss some of our transformational plans and projects under the principle of she and explain some of those which focus on the empowerment of women through entrepreneurship. Then we will hear from Ms. Tassim Hassan, who is a remarkable young Iraqi woman. At just 13, she is already embarking on a mission to advocate and care for children, women, and the planet. She hopes to give a voice for those who don't have the opportunity to express their concerns. For example, in November 2019, she discussed her mission during a presentation at the United Nations during the World Conference on Children's Rights. Today, she will speak about her hopes for young women and generation equality in Iraq. From Colombia, we will hear from Ms. Rosa Salamanca, the founder and executive director of CS. CS is a well-known organization for its work in integrating women in the peace and security agenda. Rosa has discussed her views during a presentation before the UN Security Council on Resolution 1325, which focuses on women, peace and security. Today, she will give a compelling presentation and a strategy for addressing gender-based violence. And finally, we will hear from Mr. Mick Hirsch, who is the founder and executive director of Thrive Gulu, which is based in Uganda. He will focus on COVID, but also a strategy that Thrive Gulu has developed for peace and security, as well as hope, healing, and empowerment. We are truly grateful for the time and dedication of those who are pre presenting in our session. And we greatly appreciate your attention to this session and to the very important necessity for addressing and preventing gender-based violence. Without further ado, we will now move on to our first presentation. Thank you so much, Yvonne. And thanks to the Grace Initiative Global for inviting me to be a part of this really important conversation. So as Yvonne said, I'm Karen Transgard Scott, and I'm coming to you from the state of Vermont in the United States. We're a small agricultural state located in northeastern in the northeastern part of the U.S., about 200 kilometers south of Montreal and about 500 kilometers north of New York City. So we're a very small state, small in population, small in geography. Fewer than 600,000 people live here, but we are surrounded by some of the biggest population centers in our country. As Yvonne said, I work at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, and my role there is as its executive director. My organization, the Vermont Network, serves as the leading voice on gender-based violence in Vermont. And we work with other, in the United States, we call them nonprofits, NGOs, um, that serve the survivors and victims of gender-based violence in Vermont. So we have a population of a few fewer than 600,000 people. And these organizations, there are 15 of them, serve nearly 9,000 people a year. My organization trains um, trains people who are advocates, we, and we advocate for public policies at the state and national level. And we seek to elevate the experiences and voices of survivors working toward a future where all women and girls thrive. As you all know, gender-based violence is perhaps the most pervasive factor that prevents women in Vermont and across the globe from realizing their full potential. And as is true for women in all nations, the rate and severity of 
Gender-based violence, in-home violence has dramatically increased in Vermont during the global pandemic. In some metrics indicate um, perhaps as, as much as doubled during uh, non-pandemic times. As is also true across the globe, the ability of individual women to move beyond violence depends on their experience of safety, healing, and empowerment. In Vermont, we've learned that in addition, in addition, to, in addition to safety, healing, and empowerment, women also need economic independence and to be able to live in a society that's free from misogyny and sexism. And in the case of Vermont, also free of racism. Now we know we've never experienced that world, but it's still what we're hoping for. So in that way, the Vermont network and, and all the people that are connected to it and survivors across our state are directly connected to all of you who are seeking to transform systems and society so that all women and girls can thrive. Um, our work is, uh, is extensively in, informed by the voices of survivors and we, the structure that offers that is I think unique. Uh, it, it, it's a structure that started here in the United States and is spreading across the globe, but it actually goes back to um, less formal structures that are community-based where people have distinct roles and they do distinct work all toward the same goal. So in the case of the Vermont Network, we have a goal of eradicating um, gender-based violence and working toward a world where all girls and women can thrive. And we work with communities who inform us uh, about how that can happen and what's needed to make that happen. And the, 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 um, the thing that's unique about it is the direct, uh, the direct way that we communicate and um, the structures that support that communication. So that's the Vermont network and that's what's happening in Vermont. Um, we're working hard to help survivors overcome the long-term impacts of the, of the COVID pandemic at this point. We know that survivors in Vermont have been, um, as well as all women in Vermont have been um, uh, much worse, uh, that has been much worse for them uh, because of the COVID on their ability to maintain economic independence. And um, at the same time, do childcare, uh, hold jobs, et cetera, et cetera. I know that this is true across the globe. So now I'm really pleased to be able to introduce to you Ms. Zaytoun Farage. She is the permanent mission uh, of Iraq to the, um, uh, to the new UN in Geneva and her main area of focus are human rights and gender in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Before uh, she served in this position, she served as the permanent mission of Iraq to the UN in New York. So welcome Zaytoun. So uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be present at the 65th uh, Commission on Status of Women. Uh, the focus of this uh, CSW and this session are uh, dear to my heart. As pointed out for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, my area of focus include human rights and gender rights, which are very much interrelated. So across the world, women and girls face gender-based violence, including sexual violence, domestic violence, and so-called honor violence, trafficking, and um, tragically increasing violent basis for every woman and on daily basis. According to the WHO, about one out of three women are victims of gender-based violence. So gender-based violence is understood as a violation of human rights and a form of discrimination against women and girls. The Committee of Elimination of Discrimination Against Women defined gender-based violence as a form of violence that disproportionately affects women. It can include violence against women and girls, domestic violence against women, men or children living in the same domestic unit. Although women and girls are the main victims of uh, gender-based violence, it also causes severe harm to families and 
communities. And elimination of gender-based violence is integral to any human rights policy, as is one of the most pervasive human rights violations. And gender-based violence is also a priority for sustainable development goals, especially uh, SDG5, which is about gender equality. And it abstracts hopes for respect on dreams for opportunities. And regrettably, the pandemic COVID-19 not only brought an ex unexpected health uh, risks and deaths, it brought about increase in violence, especially gender-based violence. And Iraq has suffered the same negative consequences as states due to COVID-19, which revealed the extent of gender-based violence all over the world. So according to the United Nations report on gender-based violence, global and regional reports indicate that, indicate that an alarming increase in gender-based violence cases during the pandemic, in particular domestic violence. Many of the measures necessary for controlling a viral outbreak also significantly limited the ability of survivors to shield themselves from their abusers or access support mechanisms. So sadly, the pandemic caused the increase of gender-based violence in Iraq also. With the lockdown, there was about 65% increase of cases linked to the movement restrictions and the psychoeconomic impact of the COVID-19 outbreak. So we can say that domestic violence accounted for more than three quarters of all reported gender-based violence. In Iraq, the situation is rotinely not very, um, not very, we can say good for women and girls and the pandemic make it worse. Unfortunately, generations of women living in Iraq have already endured three major regional wars and our fight against ISIS, which weakened their psychological vulnerability and social role by poverty, displacement, loss of their beloved ones. And many of women had already endured the brutally ISIS and need support to help them overcome the ruthlessness of what they had witnessed and experienced. And there is no any appropriate time for any pandemic, but if the COVID-19 came at a bad time for the world, it came at an even worse time for Iraq. After all fight, defeating of ISIS and uh, losing a very big number of beloved ones and our economic situation all together with pandemic just was not very, very good timing. To address of, uh, some of these challenges, for example, uh, the Iraqi government doing its best to just um, handle uh, the situation with pandemic uh, through the ministries, uh, which are cooperating with United Nations uh, agencies, organizations, uh, for example, the Ministry of Health 
uh, with um, cooperating with uh, WHO, World Health Organization, in developing technical support for gender-based violence counseling. They, de they, they developed uh, counseling procedures for primary health care workers to clarify management methods and referral pathways as the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Defense staff enforced the COVID movement restrictions. They also became the a key source for gender-based violence referrals. And WHO in Iraq providing training to their respective frontline workers on gender-based violence issues and care during COVID-19, as well as psychological first aid. And I don't want to uh, just finish this without saying that we have uh, many NGOs, local NGOs, which are doing a very great job. They are uh, in some fields, supporting government and doing uh, supporting uh, citizens, which is helping in the families to face this uh, pandemic, which is uh, revealing the problems and uh, as a result, gender-based violence just may be um, less than where they were not available. And WHO also developed a rapid assessment of available healthcare options for survivors of gender-based uh, violence during the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, it also surveyed healthcare workers from primary health care centers, hospitals, and mobile medical uh, clinics in 16 districts in Iraq. For those surveyed, 69 of health facilities reported that their staff received training on gender-based violence. Fo following the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, 81% of health facilities surveyed had already updated their referral pathways. And among those health facilities, 95 including gender-based violence service in their updates. And um, I wanna stop here and um, give back the flow to Ms. Karin. I think Karen is left so um, our next speaker is going to be uh, Monica. Hey, hello, good morning. Thank you for inviting uh, us to be part of this uh, meeting, Yvonne, and thank you for all the other colleagues who are present. So um, I would like to just give a, a brief overview of what's going on in Brazil. Uh, at the present stage. Um, Brazil has one of the highest rates of gender-based violence in the world. And in 2020, 648 women were victims of femicide just in the first semester, which is an increase of 2% uh, compared to the previous year. And the COVID-19 uh, pandemic may be one of the factors that influence this increase since women were staying more time at home with their potential aggressors, and in many instances had no opportunity to ask for help. In 90% of these cases, the criminal is the victim's partner or an ex-partner. And also uh, racism runs through uh, uh, violence against women. Last year, 66, 0.6% of femicide victims were black women. women. Hello, oh, someone got that? Uh, 
the percentage indicates the greatest vulnerability of this population since they represent 52.4% of the population of women in Brazil. And in comparison uh, between 2019 and 2020, there was a decrease in notifications of intentionally body injury, of threats, of rapes, and rapes of vulnerable people. And uh, according to the yearbook, these uh, uh, reportings depend on the women's appearance at the police station, which it didn't happen during the COVID pandemic. It's not, it's still not happening. Especially uh, are pointing out that domestic and family violence against women has increased on a global scale as we already heard from our colleagues during the period of social, social isolation resulting from the pandemic. Women in the dependence in situation of domestic violence may face additional obstacles uh, due to the COVID pandemic. One of them is greater difficulty to report these, uh, 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 these cases and search for assistance. And that's why we saw uh, decreasing numbers. But why Brazil being a democratic country with apparent freedom has such high rates of gender-based violence? And uh, one of the root causes is that Brazil has a patriarchal culture heritage and uh, many social inequalities are among, which are among the biggest challenges that influence the increase in gender-based violence. Culturally, the perpetuation of violence stems from a legacy of colonization, oppression, and exploitation with its economic development structure, structurally based on racialized relations. Brazil only eliminated slavery 127 years ago against 30, uh, 388 years of legal slavery. It was the last country to abolish slavery in the world. It also experienced two dictatorships in the Republic period during which violence, including against women, was an institution. Recently, Brazil enacted legislation to protect the human rights of women and youth. Until 2002, the Brazilian Civil Code considered married women as incapable. As with slavery, which legalized the treatment of black human beings as things. So it's very much into the uh, 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 how do you say it? In, into uh, into the heritage of the country. And although Brazil has taken legal many legal steps towards gender equality, from the ratification of the Convention on Elimination of Violence Against Women in 1979 to salary equity in 1988. Brazil still has a long way to go, especially in terms of violence against women. For example, despite increase in female representation government and, stri and strides toward female center uh, legislation in the country, Brazil continues to have one of the highest rates of femicide in the world. Even as general murder rates in the country fall, uh, the, uh, the, the murders of femis, uh, I mean, the femicide rates increase. Violence has profound consequences from the physical and mental health of people who experience it, having an impact on the psycho, psychosocial development of children and adolescents, on the well being of families and communities, constituting challenges for the health managers and professionals. However, in various contexts, these aggressions still function as punishment, imposition of rules and political dom domination. In according to the 2020 yearbook of public security and the Atlas of Violence, violence against women and girls, although already 
high increase during the COVID-19 pandemic, worsening gender-based violence, uh, trafficking risk of women and girls. Violence against women and girls increased significantly to such an extent that it's now referred to the shadow pandemic as Yvonne also mentioned before. This attests to the necessity for the support in terms of how to get safety, how to or where to go for recovery and to get the employment and empower of women and girls. Although uh, uh, there are many laws already in place to protect against gender-based violence in Brazil, as mentioned before, uh, the best tool that we have, and, and it's the empowerment of women and girls. So uh, this is the best way that we can remedy this situation. And uh, with that in mind, there are a few positive uh, actions happening in Brazil. It's just a few that I'm gonna mention here uh, that may, may help to change this situation. Uh, just last week, uh, it was announced by the mayor of Rio de Janeiro that he will sign in the coming days, it hasn't been done yet, a decree that prohibits different treatment between men and women in awards for any event and or sports competition held in the city of Rio. The rule will apply to stages who's organized uh, by the city hall of Rio. So this is a good beginning. <laughs> and another example is uh, an NGO from Rio de Janeiro called Viva Rio has also expanded their project called Academia para las Negras. It's a project that promotes soccer training uh, towards prof professionalization and education of youth in vulnerable communities of Rio de Janeiro to include more young women and girls in the program. Before, they, they always had uh, girls, but a very small amount. Now they want to have the majority of the youth being women of girls, which is very good because they lack opportunities to develop themselves through the sport. And uh, as a curiosity, although Brazil is a nation of soccer lovers, everybody knows Brazil by soccer, professional soccer was forbidden to women until 1979. And since then, there are still very few opportunities for uh, women and girls to develop professionally in, in uh, the sports. Another uh, good uh, event that happened recently with this month is that all Supreme Federal Court ministers uh, voted to endorse the decision that declared the thesis of legitimate defense of honor in the judgment of crimes against life unconstitutional. This thesis, this thesis used to be often used by lawyers defending cases of femicide. So this was a great change too. And also recently Google, uh, the company Google offer a free training to empower and capacitate women through their program called Growth with Google. And uh, Another good example, all of them happened recently. Uh, it's the Uber, uh, the, the uh, taxi, no, how do you call it? The, the transport uh, app announced a partnership uh, in partnership with Avon Institute, which is a makeup company for women and the American advertising agency with Whedon plus Kennedy, the creation of a virtual assistant to assist women victims of domestic violence during the COVID-19 period. The initiative is part of a series of measures adopted by Uber in more than 16 countries with the aim of helping victims of domestic violence. The tool is called Angela, can be activated by WhatsApp number. By women, by women who are feeling threatened at home, which is very interesting because sometimes they're at home and 
it's difficult to call and what we were peers is like they are calling a friend called Angela. Huh? And thanks to the uh, popular interface, the virtual assistant can collect some information about the situation to identify the degree of risk that the victim is taking, provided the uh, support right away. And Uber can also give them uh, a code to be picked up by an Uber uh, uh, a driver for free to be taken to a safe place. And another initiative was a bill uh, by Senator uh, Wellington Fagundes proposed to reserve at least 30% of the seat for women in the Chamber of Deputies, legislative assemblies, and municipal councils. Uh, the proposal also provides that when two thirds of federal Senate is renewed, one of the vacancies will be reserved for female candidates and the other for male candidates. Uh, that's helpful because uh, one of the problems in Brazil that is that although women are the majority of the voters, they do not vote for other women. So you, you, you don't reach a majority of women representation uh, wherever is needed. Uh, this is also part of a, a cultural trend that needs to change. So these are just a few examples of actions taking place in Brazil to try to revert and mediate the cultural trends. But a lot more is needed. It will take a few generations to change the mind setting that may help to reduce gender-based violence in Brazil. But the fight continues and we move on trying to bring more awareness to women and the society in general, try to empower uh, women and girls will certainly be the best tool. And I believe that uh, Roseanne, who is the next speaker, uh, will bring you more perspectives of good initiatives that have been taking place in Brazil. But thank you very much. Thank you. And I pass you now to Roseanne. Thank you. Roseanne. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, I think you guys don't see me, but can you re can you hear me? Listen to me. Hear you. Okay. Uh, I wanted could you, could I share uh, one presentation? Don't sure. want to hear from me this option. Okay, hold on one minute. I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> Easier said than done. Hold yeah. On. Sorry, but I, I will support myself with this some slides. Language is not my best skill, skill the English, so this make it for me comfortable. First of all, I'm gonna try to introduce myself. Monica bring to us a lot of, brought to us a lot of uh, data about the context in Brazil. So I wanna put myself as this kind of a statistic uh, the part of what I am, so I woman, heterosexual and cis, who comes from this reality, you no? Know? Uh, my culture, my identity and the experiences are that of a black Brazilian woman lives here. I was born, born from an act of sexual violence against my mother and I know what it's like to live as a child without food at the table. So I know what is live multiple forms of violence in the territory that I live, that I live it, and the, from distorted religious beliefs. So when I talk about this topic, about the GBV, or about women and girls, I'm talking from an empathic uh, process in the, with living in Brazil that I know as well. So also I know to be what it looks like be the first person or generation of the poor family to go to university to understand the transformative power of education, of political engagement, to change the society and the importance to have met a, a new person who believed me in me when I didn't. I, I just did this introduce, uh, introduction because I think it's important to why 
I work right now in CIEDES. CIEDES is the Integrated Center for Sustainable Development Studies and Programs, uh, who uh, promotes networks for prosperity. And the, for prosperity, we see people, communities, society as in a large way, but we traduce this as good health, good nutrition, income, respect for all in the nature, and above all, confidence in the future. We can't develop a democratic society. We can develop a uh, inclusion, a social inclusion, uh, more or more dignified for people if we don't have a democratic process and confidence in the future. It's a pillar for that. As organization, we have uh, uh, some kind of strategies uh, working with youth people. Uh, along our 23 years uh, of existence. And uh, a lot of, of these uh, projects we became, we transformed in social technologies to open knowledge, to uh, bring for other organizations a person, in person some reference and to make sure that we are on the way. So we are uh, providing effective results for the society. As an organization, we work in four big areas. Uh, education, it's more formal with the public system, with community engagement, inclusion and well-being, and entrepreneurship. So uh, these four areas uh, make sure we have an integrated and an inter integral form to see the individual. Uh, we have uh, uh, to change the situations of violence, we need to pursue the roots of these cases. And the economic uh, inequalities is one of that. So that's why I'm gonna uh, introduce more this kind of speech in my uh, explanation. In the, as in, at the end and organization, we are composed for almost to 2,000 employees. And uh, we represent as women, cis and trans, 66% of the organization and 53% uh, of the leadership positions. So when we talk about it, it's not about beneficiaries as well uh, as the organization too. We need to make sure that we are in the path. You know? So our experience, uh, came from, I, I mean, got, I'm not going to exchange a lot in data because of a uh, uh, presentation of Monica. I'm going to just uh, uh, reinforce one point. We are talking about a uh, different kind of uh, structural phenomenon here in Brazil, and we can not uh, uh, disassociate uh, violence uh, against the women between uh, from the uh, racism and sexism situations. This is a huge key for change the world, for change the, the Brazil situation. And uh, we have uh, the beliefs and the cultural beliefs and the, in the roots of this process. So work in education for inequality, work for uh, search for justice in the specific cases is so many important, so much important for this process. So our experience, entering about our experience uh, with uh, youth entrepreneurship and education. We work uh, from the beginning, uh, since we, we were founded 23 years ago, with the base of pyramids. It doesn't matter if we are talking about the social business, business, generating income, social projects, are in each area we are working. This is our, uh, our reform is uh, based on this kind of uh, uh, people who has less opportunity, less economic and social and rights opportunity. Anyway, we work uh, in three, Three, uh, three axes integrated with youth people. We make us entrepreneurship and the youth leadership, employability, education, the citizenship, 
as a uh, a way to develop skills to develop to develop uh, new results with this kind of person that will, it will work. Uh, so we encourage and strengthen the engagement and the leading social participation of young people in collective actions that generate changes and improvements in their contexts, in their territories. For example, uh, with this kind of strategy in the last year, we provided almost uh, five million reais, one million dollar, something like that, uh, in income generated from young people in vulnerable situation from our apprentice, apprenticeship program, as well from the social enterprises created, accelerated, and are assisted by us, focused on peripheral youth, women, and migrants. Uh, if we talk about the people from this base of pyramids, so we are talking about uh, race, we are talking about uh, uh, age, the peripheral area in Brazil, the age is, is lower than other areas in Brazil. And uh, we concentrate all the uh, worst stati statistics about uh, violence, different kind of violence and uh, for women as Monica presented to us too. And uh, in, 35, in 34 days, uh, I would say here we have a lot of volunteer working uh, working with us. Uh, why I say that? Because uh, it's, the, it's just not about work uh, with one beneficiary, with one person who are in suffering situation. It's how we can uh, build a large conscious, a large uh, engagement of the society and social problems and complex problems. So volunteer occupy space, it just not, not just like a, a person who can bring some ideas or some uh, uh, work forces. It's not about that. It's about uh, uh, build a, a conscious process in the society too. Between 55 and 28% is the public that we work in our projects, who I could say is girl and women. So the, we have a, a high level of uh, uh, audience of women and girls in, the, in our projects. To, try to work with beliefs and behaviors, that's why we feel that the point that we think uh, to put a lot of effort to change things uh, needs to be supported by researchers, but assessment that can provide uh, uh, evidences, objective evidence for us to keep uh, working. So we developed uh, a psychometric methodology, methodology to apply to our projects and make sure that we know better this person. And we, when I just bring this here, it's uh, sometimes we talk about, oh, let's do some program for accelerate business, social business for women, or some uh, program for employability as uh, an opportunity to income, to generate an income. Anyway, the person who was dealing with this kind of situation of violence, it doesn't matter if you just bring some instrumental or technical process to develop new skills with them. We need to keep this uh, in mind, how we provide a huge self-knowledge, how we provide a huge uh, perspective how to relation to each other, how to relation in this society, and what is my role in this society. Uh, we don't need a lot of emprendedor, uh, entrepreneurs uh, around the world as a business or a person. We need an entrepreneur as people who can provide the change in the world, in the territory, in their own lives. So this perspective, we work a lot with our 
uh, in our projects to make sure that we can move, you can change beliefs and behaviors. One example of that is Engaja in Portuguese, we call Engaja in English means engage. So this project we work with UNICEF, for example, in Segamba, we had a huge portfolio. So I'm just gonna bring some, uh, some picks up of this project. Uh, we work in a territory uh, of Sao Paulo, the municipality, with young people and adolescents between 15 and 21 years old. And uh, we try to develop the life skills, competence for social entrepreneurship and promotion of opportunities with employers and train entitled. This is important because we, we are talking since the individual until the perspective of the employability or entrepreneurship. We do this uh, trying to uh, produce education between pairs and the, the perspective of territory. Sometimes the experiences, uh, the most significant in experience that people live is in their uh, neighborhood. It's not so long. We know we have internet, we have a digital process that uh, brings another perspective from time, from distance, but the territory, the neighborhood is a important place for people, even for a uh, happy experience, but for to understand the social protection network that they have there and how this, how can they, how can be, how can they be doing something different uh, for their life by looking for the territory? So we work uh, in this case with 300 young people and uh, we are expanding for one more 1,000 in another state. But uh, in our uh, journal uh, for a year, we have uh, almost uh, 80,000 uh, young people uh, as beneficiary of our works. But we, not, we put this person in the first plan, so we put they as protagonist in the process, not just a beneficiary of the process. It is, is a, a principle for us. So from this, we, during the, during the pandemic process, uh, trying to, we are trying to develop strategies, digital strategies to support this kind of principle doing the, uh, their journey. Uh, we don't need to just uh, explanations about empathy, about be generous, about creative, about uh, uh, how to deal with conflict. They need to live experiences, uh, practical experiences to understand better this possibility. So even in a digital platform, we trying to bring a representative process, uh, all the experience in, intentionally of change requires they perceive themselves repre represented in their realities, in their, in the smallest details, but all the time exercise the power of choice uh, in a fluid relationship between the self, the self, the other, and the society in which they are inserted. So identity territory and the future entrepreneur, diversity, mental health and uh, mentoring for uh, perspective of employability. This is how we can uh, see the individual in different perspectives and uh, bring to them uh, some discussions and not just for girls, but for boys too. Uh, if, we need to, if we have a chance to change the, the process, we need the men we need the boys together. So we started this at the beginning in the first years of their life. So I hope you guys could uh, uh, complain in my English and uh, trying to, to explanation. The, the main point is uh, youth, if you, if, you, if you started at the beginning, you have more chance in the future. 
Uh, of course, we work with adults. We have uh, uh, other projects to support women in difficult situation, in vulnerable situations. But uh, here we're talking about uh, create uh, new perspectives for the future. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Roseanne. I think that was very compelling and it's along the theme that we have of safety, healing and empowerment, but you gave us insight in terms of the relationships that have to be developed and the job skills, but also the, the sense of healing and I don't wanna say psychotherapy sounds a little bit cliche, but you know how people can have their own self power um, to move forward and with youth, it's so important for the future generations. So thank you so much. Okay, um, our next speaker is Mustafa from Grace Initiative Iraq. Yeah, hi <laughs> all, welcome. Uh, it's my sincere honor to participate in this session with such a dedicated and capable woman. They are indeed represent the inspiration of female empowerment. Currently, we are organizing the, the, the development of a Grace Initiative in Iraq. One of our main focuses will be on female empowerment. In terms of projects in Iraq, Grace Initiative uh, has collaborated with Mercy Hands for a humanitarian assistant uh, and creating a women training center. And this, uh, so this focused on empowerment uh, of women and girls uh, who are still struggling with, uh, with the aftermath of war with violent extremists. Many of the women are widowed and economically disadvantaged. To this end, the Women's Training Center provided trauma healing, vocational training, including in uh, horticulture and basic IT skills and job placement. So in addition, we are cooperated with, uh, with Mercy Hand for a cash for work during which uh, women receive uh, sewing machines and uh, materials to sew masks for uh, school kids so that may take their final exams. We are appreciate our collaboration with uh, Mercy Hand and the planning to continue the good uh, partnership between us. Yeah. So for future projects, we are focusing on developing an empowerment uh, project involving a collaboration with organic date farmers and women also, especially those who are victimized by uh, a violence. Uh, the project is unique uh, in view of the collaboration and focus. We will seek to ensure the best uh, practice uh, uh, for environment, uh, support the organic farmers, and empower women with both skills in agriculture, enhance value in uh, marketing, uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, the date will, will come packaged in uh, biodegradable boxes. Uh, uh, we hope by the next uh, CSW, you will have a chance to purchase and test the dates. Uh, like you all know, Iraq is uh, really famous with, uh, with dates and the numbers are really uh, increased like uh, on, on the last uh, few years. So now Iraq focusing on uh, a different income instead of oil. So uh, it's like we, we're thinking about a uh, different uh, uh, supplies for, for, for Iraq. I mean, economically, it's uh, like in the past, it was really bad. For, so uh, it will help the Iraqi economy and also women who, who really need work. Like uh, what my friend, uh, Zaytun, thanks for her to mention uh, all the numbers. So in addition, we are planning to develop a YouTube channel for our women. Like you know, Iraqi witnessing a feminist movement uh, led by activists and local organizations to develop women and uh, enhance their uh, role in building society. 
participation in, uh, and uh, also decision making and equality with men. In order, uh, in order to encourage society to accept the role of women and give the women uh, the importance uh, of women uh, participation. Media awareness uh, is a great tool to direct the light to the potential of, uh, of women and give them uh, opportunity to present uh, their achievement uh, through a free media platform, clearly uh, present uh, these opinion uh, and uh, problems also. We suggested to establish the media platform depending on female staff mostly to ensure that they can express uh, themselves freely. Thirdly, we are in the process uh, of exploring uh, or following up the Pope's visit, like you all know, uh, in terms of interfaith discourse. We will include Arula for gender equality also. I appreciate your very kind attention and thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. <laughs> Okay, Thanks. to the gallery. And now our next speaker, also from Iraq, <laughs> is Tasneem. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm going to try, uh, can we have your beautiful face? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna put you on the um, speaker. I think you have to hit the video maybe. You still have a, there you are. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tasneem. I'm from Iraq and I'm happy to share with you my perspective about the situation of women and girls under the pandemic. We women and girls everywhere must have equal rights and opportunities and be able to live free of violence and discrimination. Women's equality and empowerment is one of the 17 sustainable development goals and also integral to all dimensions of inclusive development. In my country, I think there's some um, gender equality, especially if we talk about labor fields, but the problem is in the challenges that women and girls face while trying to participate. I I'm sorry, practice their right. <laughs> For example, they're exposed to sexual violence. Um, they could never feel comfortable in their own body. Also us women, we don't have a strong voice to men since we are not big decision makers in this country. Sometimes traditions affect gender equality in some households. Girls have no right to get an equal education. The situation becomes even worse under the pandemic when girls had been enforced to stay home for a long time and be exposed to more violence from men. It hasn't been always good. Some women are throwing their throwing their kids away to shelters and they're finding other ways to get rid of them. One of the main causes for that is that women are getting married at such a young age and they're not fully mature to take the responsibility. I can't blame her. She's surrounded by a society that tells her what's wrong and what's right. Apart, um, she has to know her right apart from society perspective, which is to some extent, extent based on the bad traditions and stereotypes. You know, sometimes in a frame, society doesn't always see the women's side of the story. They mainly focus on the men's side of the story. Now, what I mean is that gender equality cannot be unless there's a real respect from men to women. And that respect is the result of hard work and awareness. It starts from the school to educate children how to respect the other who are different in gender, religion, belief, race, and other characteristics. And that responsibility of the way parents raise their own children and also the role of the society through social media to lead children and to teach them what's right and what's wrong. In conclusion, although women and girls suffer through things, but they are the main creator of life, the light of the day, and behind every independent girl, there is an open-minded father who trusted and supported her, but not the society. To me, what a feminist is anyone who recognizes the equality and full humanity of women and men. Life is not a competition between men and women. It's a collaboration between them. I thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. And we are now going to go to Rosa um, Salamanca from Bogota. 
Good morning. Mm, thank you so much for this invitation. And well, after he hearing Tasneen is very little to say and all the, the women and men that have talked before me. For Colombia, this issue of young women and women in general is as in Brazil, a very complicated matter, unlike in all the world. And in our context, as you all know, we have a long-term conflict now and that we had a peace agreement. Although we have this peace agreement and all this context in Colombia, we'll still have many uh, factors of violence. And all these violence factors affect uh, women and young women. And I think they are affected in many ways, in many ways, and are affected in a very different way if the background and the cultural identity is different. So it's very different how a native and indigenous women are affected. It is very different how black and Afro descendant people are affected. It's very different how peace and sun people in rural areas are affected and urban women and, and girls. And I want to emphasize in that because we don't, and we hardly can have only one answer. We have very, we are seeking and looking for many diverse answers for many, for all the cultural and identity diversity that we have here as you have in Brazil and in other parts of the world. But that means that we have been working and we have been trying to uh, have networks that are really working to, to I think we are aware of, of, of violence against women, but there are so many issues that we have to address in a very integral way to make this happen and this change that we are still far away. I think that violence against women within the pandemic and COVID has increased and has shown once more that when crises are in society, women and, and, and girls will really have the effect of the big crisis. Maybe it's com internal conflicts, it's humanitarian crisis, it's another way of behavior. But this is a huge impact. So we have done a lot of programs to move forward, but now we have to recognize that in the moment that the COVID began, women went back to their homes, children went back to their homes, and in many places, violence began to arise and arise and arise. Not only violence inside the, the houses and the, and the families, but also many women have lost their jobs, as you all know, but this has also a huge impact in, in children and in girls, because then the mothers, and we have an increasing number of mothers that are the heads of the family, so they have to support. So the girls are the ones that are staying at home or the mothers have to see how they can live in this context that is so complex. There are many tools, there are apps that we have done that the networks have done, but this pushback is a big question for all of us. Why every time there is a big crisis, gender issues pushes back? Why? What is happening there? Why we cannot solve this crisis in another way that the impact will not be in the shoulders, the resilient shoulders of women and, and girls? So I want to, to pose that question there because I think that now we are repeating our stories once again, once again, 
uh, having gender and having women uh, resisting and giving their care and the way of behavior and the way of cultural um, roles to support all these crises. Now I want to say also that there is something in Latin America that we have to recognize and as Colombians we recognize. We are in very complicated patriarchal societies and this patriarchal and machista as we call them, male frame uh, societies are very, are, are inside of us in our culture uh, it doesn't matter that we are men or women. That's why I believe what just as Neem said, this is not a fight between men and women. This is a fight about how we can be humans that are different and respect other humans. So I think that in this, in this context, we have really in Latin America, because I am res very respectful of other contexts. In Latin America, we have really to work in cultural behaviors because these cultural behaviors are exacerbated in the moments of crisis. And I think Brazil will share this with me because in violent environments, crisis and violence against women increases in an incredible way. So now we are, for example, working about dismantling because of the peace agreement. We are trying to dismantle groups and conducts that are still working in all this conflict and violent environment. But when you want to find the answers, the real deep answers, you have to change very deeply your own culture. When violent people in home or outside the home, in home, in the family, in, the, in being a father or being a, a brother or being a, someone in, in a partner or outside, when you have conflicts, armed people and so on and so, they will have the same gender behavior. They will have the same. So it's so important. Now, my recommendations. I think that we have to continue working very strongly to change educational ways of behavior in the schools, in everywhere. I think we have to do a multi a multi reframing and educational for addressing this kind of violence. We need to have nuances. We need to have programs and we need to have funds. We need to have architectural structure, very serious architectural structure inside institutions, inside states that will really address this problem. This is a pandemic, like Yvonne said at the beginning. This is a pandemic. It's a pandemic all over the world that is more increased in some places, in others less increased, but it's a whole pandemic. We need funds. We need real political addressing of these issues. And we need to have clues in education, in health, and to have an integral program between states and civil society organizations that will really, really address this pandemic because we cannot still continue, continue giving small campaigns, small issues, small things. We need to have a huge response to this increasing problem every day. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Wow. Thank you so much, Rosa. That was um, very insightful and kind of very energizing. <laughs> and I think one of the points that you pointed out was that this is the pandemic now, but we could have another crisis and will we have another shadow pandemic unless we start to grapple with these issues which are always there anyway. It's just came, was heightened, but it's still significantly part of society and it's, 
it takes a holistic change and from many levels, but first we have to have a commitment and a network. So thank you so much. I hope he's starting the network right here on this small session. <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, our next speaker is Mick Hirsch. Mick? Great, thank you so much, um, Yvonne. I think I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, I think I might be able to do it on my end. So let's see, can you all see that? Yes, we can. Excellent, okay, great. Um, let me see, is this, uh, great. So first of all, I wanna thank, um, I wanna thank Yvonne, uh, who is a, a friend of mine for inviting me to this, uh, this forum and her organization, um, Grace uh, Initiative. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will also wanna thank all of these panelists who have just been excellent, and uh, it's a it's an honor to be amongst you. I think certainly this uh, this is the creation of a network, and um, I, I'd say that this forum in itself has been empowering, um, insofar as uh, we learn from one another, and we're inspired by one another, and ultimately we stand together uh, with one another. So, um, so I'm I'm grateful to be here, and uh, that we're doing that we're, we're doing this today. So um, my name. Is, is Mick, and I am the president and executive director of Thrive Gulu, um, which is an organization in northern Uganda. And I'm going to be talking to you just a little bit about our organization, um, but mostly some, some of the challenges that uh, individuals are facing, mainly women and, and girls in uh, northern Uganda. Um, and then some of the solutions that we've um, been been using during this time of the of the pandemic. Um, so our organization was uh, started founded uh, eleven years ago by Judy Dushku, uh, who was a professor at a university in Boston, and it was in the aftermath um, at, of the twenty plus year war that was perpetrated by Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance. Army in Northern Uganda. And so Judy founded this organization as a trauma recovery and empowerment organization. And, um, and then over, over time, we've, uh, we've, we've kind of crafted ourselves as a holistic uh, program. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go along. But one of the things we just want to, you know, we talk about is what does it mean to thrive? And that's where, of course, our name comes from. And it's that we believe that meaningful existence requires more than mere survival. Uh, the invisible wounds of psychological trauma de deserve healing, and that functionality, productivity, and sustainability can only manifest when an individual or community are more than surviving. So, um, one of the concepts I want to really focus on today is is disorientation, uh, and what I mean by that is that um, disorientation is is when you wake up. World is not the world you expected it. To. Um, now, disorientation is a word that you will find uh, in discussions about psychosocial health, but they tend to use it a little bit differently than I use it. Um, what I want to kind of push is something that's actually a bit more philosophical and, and something that we would call ontological, um, meaning that what I'm interested in trying to get at is how our being how our very being is affected during a limit experience. And I don't think it's too much to say that uh, this pandemic has been kind of a global and collective limit experience for many, many people. Um, and so for me, when I'm thinking about these, uh, you know, how this, how this crisis has affected us, um, I, I want to go a little bit deeper than, than just um, some of the, the, the standard psychosocial issues that, um, that we tend to think about. I still think those are, of course, very, very important, and I'm going to get to those. But what I want to do now is just kind of go through some of the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the, the crises that took place um, during this COVID-19 that were kind of disorienting. So um, first of all, I found it very interesting that police announced that they would not prosecute small crimes like stealing chickens or goats. Now, that may not sound all that uh, powerful, but in fact, I think it really is because um, women were the ones who tended mainly to this. Um, and now, um, you know, these, these things that you wouldn't think would be just all of a sudden kind of a, a threat in terms of being stressed 
stripped from your uh, your kind of uh, homestead um, is now something that you have to uh, seriously be concerned about. Transportation was restricted. Uh, So that meant that mainly women had to walk extraordinary distances now to the market to sell just a percentage of goods that they normally sell at a percentage of the price to a percentage of the normal customers. Um, so profits were, were slashed in just incredible ways. And, uh, and people were sometimes um, you know, left without any goods to sell uh, because the borders were closed and they couldn't get um, some of the goods that they normally would get from Kenya, South Sudan, or the DRC. And, um, and they would be left at the market with very, very few customers and very, very few sales. Um, in, in Northern Uganda, one of the, one of the more awful uh, illnesses or conditions that you find is something called nodding syndrome, which is, um, is kind of endemic to uh, this, this region. It's, a, it's kind of like a, it's a form of epilepsy, um, but it's really just horrific. Worst things that I've seen in the 20 plus years of, of working in, uh, in in kind of trauma and, and international work, um, and the caregivers for individuals with nodding syndrome, and these are mainly children who are affected by nodding syndrome. The the age, um, the lifespan is usually somewhere between 16 and 20 years. You can live longer than that, but these are usually children and youth who are affected by this. And uh, the primary caregivers are parents, or I mean, are, are uh, mothers. Um, or some other woman within the family, and um, and it's a 24-hour uh, caregiving responsibilities. Uh, so it's it's very very um, difficult to begin with. Well, during the COVID-19, caregivers had to these women had to go, mothers had to go farther from home in order to find work and sell goods, uh, which meant they often had to leave children behind, and they were they had to resort to shackling them. Um, which is just um, a heinous human rights uh, abuse, and yet they were kind of forced into this. Um, and uh, if they weren't shackling them, uh, or even if they were, they were sometimes having to being forced to make young children become the primary caregivers of uh, these other children with very complex medical conditions. Uh, those with mental health had very difficult times accessing medications. And then the plainclothes police um, is, uh, is, is something where, um, you know, the government hires individuals who are not trained police officers um, to essentially take on this, this role of being, uh, you know, policing as a bully. They pay them, uh, you know, sub-poverty wages, give them a club, and basically gratify their uh, masculinity by giving them a blank abuse people. And uh, a, a lot of time women were the, the, um, uh, the, the victims of that. Um, so are children at lower risk of COVID-19 than adults? This is a question that was very seriously asked, especially at the beginning um, of, of the COVID outbreak. Um, but I'm taking this a little bit differently. So children uh, were faced with a lot dropouts schools were closed and so of course uh, they were they were dropping dropping out because of that. But the, the problem was that they weren't coming back when the schools were open um, so you have a lot of out of, out of school children which puts them in vulnerable places this of course is disproportionately affecting girls teenage pregnancies child marriage um, because uh, families were so desperate Uh, income generation uh, to sell off uh, to marriages and then child disappearances and there are all different reasons for this from abductions um, and just neglect where children would wander off um, and child abuse and trafficking so are children at lower risk of COVID-19 than adults uh, people were asking the right question they just probably weren't asking it quite in the right way because um, some of these very important issues were uh, getting all of the getting attention and uh, being addressed appropriately. So when is lockdown not a protective measure? So I've we've we've talked about this um, and, and several of us have already talked about this, but I think it's really important to to emphasize that um, with all of the different types of of gender based violence that was taking place, it was really exploiting existing power relations. So pre existing power power relations. Being, uh, we're, we're being kind of uh, exacerbated and, and uh, exploited um, as well as gender stereotypes.
stereotypes. A lot of things are already there, but made worse. So we see a, a major spike in GBV incidents. Um, and by major, we were, uh, our organization was seeing as many as three times um, as, as, uh, as many reports uh, and incidents. And those were just the ones that were, were reported because a lot of people, uh, a lot of women were even less likely to report uh, GBV incidents out of fear uh, and out of confusion about seeking help. Uh, there was difficulty accessing services because they were turned away at health facilities. I mentioned the transportation was very difficult, so they weren't even able to actually get physically there. Um, they were turned away by police. Uh, they were their neighbors were not helping. There was a lot of mistrust and fear. Uh, husbands were blaming, and uh, there was a, this overwhelming sense of just disorientation around uh, around issues of of gender. This is how trauma works. So especially in Northern Uganda, what I'm interested in here is that during the war, these are some of the things that people experienced. During the war, they experienced forced separation from family, limited services, misinformation campaigns, no work, no, no health care or poor health care, distrust of everyone, everyone is a threat. Good people become violent. They, they resort to theft, they resort to GBV or alcohol abuse. Movement, afraid to go outside, depression, anxiety, stress, and suicidal thoughts. All of these things that took place during the, the Lord's Resistance Army War all of a sudden resurface. And that is extraordinarily re-traumatizing for people. Um, and a lot of times people, you know, they, they, you, don't, you don't recognize these things and you don't make these connections when you are suffering with, from trauma, when you're experiencing trauma. Um, and yet this is what's informing oftentimes or a lot of the time, um, some of the trauma, again, it's making it worse, it's making it more disoriented. Uh, no health without mental health. So let me turn now a little bit to what Thrive is. So um, Thrive Gulu is a holistic trauma recovery organization. So um, we take the WHO's declaration, no health without mental health, four big steps further. Okay, so we believe that not only no health without mental health, but no mental health without financial health and spiritual health and social health and model. So this is something that I came up with um, and that our organization has been um, kind of piloting as, as a model. And it's actually in the process as we speak of its first kind of uh, validation exercise. Um, I don't have time to get into each one of these. If you're interested, I'm happy to share a little bit more. But the, the Five to Thrive model is uh, kind of our, our comprehensive, holistic approach to trauma recovery. So our best our best innovations in times of pandemic. First of all, good relationship with local authorities. Uh, Thrive Gulu was selected to be on the Gulu District Task Force Health, uh, we were, which meant that we were given more freedom to travel by car uh, despite the travel restrictions. And that, of course, Thrive uh, has used call-in call radio shows, and that's a way that we were able to disseminate information on public health and gender-based violence issues uh, related specifically during the pandemic, so things about um, you know, how, ice, how people are feeling isolated and how that can lead to depression and how uh, lack of, uh, of financial income can lead to uh, you know, suicidal thoughts, that sort of thing. In addition, we would always bring with us a representative from the local public health uh, department who would be able to provide an update on public health announcements related to COVID-19. Uh, one of the other things we did related to this is that we distributed transistor radios to women because uh, generally men had been the ones who owned and controlled uh, the radios, but we really wanted to make sure that women had access to these messages. and training lay counselors and GBV monitors. So we weren't actually training them, but we were utilizing them. Uh, and I'll get to this point in just a second, but uh, our lay counselors and GBV monitors are frontline community responders to basically help us out in the, in the areas of crisis intervention, emotional support, intake, and referrals. And referrals are especially important. Uh, the 
referrals to thrive professional counselors and gender-based violence specialists. Now, I, I'm kind of um, a little tongue in cheek here when I say our best innovations, because our best innovations actually weren't innovations at all. And I think that that's actually really important. And I'm proud of this because um, we were already doing all of these things. And so we didn't have to, we didn't have to implement them. We didn't have to come up with them. They were already in place. We already had good relationships with local authorities, which meant, you know, you can't just develop good relationships with local authorities overnight. It takes years to really do that. And so we had a lot, we had these things in place. And, and, um, and I, I guess my point is just um, that it's so important to, um, to, to, you know, do the things that you're already doing and, and do them in such a way that, um, that they're solid and that you can build upon them. Because um, as, you know, as, as some people have mentioned, um, you know, there's always the possibility and the likelihood that something else is going to come up. And so if you're already kind of prepared, it's great. I had no idea that we were prepared in these ways for for a pandemic. It wasn't something that I had ever been thinking of. That when we that when we were you doing radio shows um, every every couple months, that that would come in so handy for us. That we already had these relationships with uh, with radio shows and and so on and so forth. So that was really important. In addition to that, however, we did fill some gaps. So there were two main gaps that we tried to. One is was. Um, caravans. So what we realized is that even in some of the very, very remote um, locations, there was there was just no, no good information, at least if not any information that was getting um, to these rural communities. And, uh, and, and so we, we wanted to make sure, though, that they were being um, serviced because basically shutting down. So what we did was we, uh, we rented a pickup truck and a sound system, and we drove out to these hard to reach rural areas. And again, we had access to this because of our relationship with the local authorities and our role on the task force. Um, and that enabled us to provide some information on mental health and gender-based violence during the pandemic. Um, and again, we brought with us a representative from the public health department so that that individual could also uh, share some important public health messages on COVID-19.